Pull it out of the fridge. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Do you think I need it? I probably. No. At this time, I will call the meeting of the Marshall City Council to order with the Pledge of Allegiance. At the, I'd also note um, Council Member uh, Moaleski is unable to stand because of a broken foot. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. like to welcome everyone here this evening. We do have an agenda before us. Are there any changes to that agenda? If not, we'll operate it under that agenda. The first item would be to consider the approval of the minutes of the regular council meeting and the special meeting. Both were held on February 28, 2023. Council does have the minutes of both of those meetings. Are there any corrections to note at this time? I'll make a motion to approve. At second. Motion by Jim, seconded by John to approve the minutes as they have been presented. We'll move to a vote. And we'll close the voting. And the motion does pass. The next set of agenda items that we have are consider awards of bids. And we have a number of them to consider this evening. So agenda item number two is to consider the bituminous overlay on various city streets. Uh, we will consider the resolution uh, that would accept the bid and award the contract. To present this agenda item, I will call on Jason Anderson, City Engineer, Director of Public Works. Jason. Thank you, Mayor. Um, on March 7th, we received bids for the uh, project that you mentioned, our annual mill and overlay project. The project's a little bit larger in size this year due to um, wastewater budget having some funds for uh, some of their surfaces on their properties to be resurfaced as well. Um, in addition, we've got an agreement with ADM to partner on North 7th Street where ADM pays for the truck stacking lane and the city marshal pays for um, the, the street right away proper. Um, low bid was submitted by Dunnick Inc in the amount of $887,990.20. Um, in order to, um, it was a little above budget, and in order to get back on budget, we'd propose to strike a couple streets from the list. Um, doing so reduces the project quantity and gets us on budget. So in the fiscal impact uh, portion of the agenda, you can see the breakdown of the project with 613000 roughly coming from the street department budget where we were allotted 625,000. Uh, remainder of the project costs would be covered by wastewater or uh, ADM. We would recommend to award the contract with those amendments to Dunnick Inc. Okay, thank you, Jason. Questions? So to clarify, Jason, this will be coming under what was budgeted with the two, I believe it's the two roads removed, uh, Floyd Wall Drive and Canoga Park Drive. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion or questions? If not, is there a motion? Move to approve. I'll second Motion that. by Craig, seconded by Jim to approve the uh, resolution that will accept the bid and award <coughs> the contract. Discussion on that motion? If not, we'll move to a vote. And we'll close the voting. And the motion does pass. Agenda item number three is Channel Parkway pavement replacement project. We have several items to consider here. First would be a resolution that would accept the bid and award the contract. Secondly would be the resolution that would authorize the execution of the MnDOT grant agreement that funds a portion of this project. Jason. Thank you. Um, this project is a, it's largely a mill and overlay project, a three inch mill and overlay at Channel Parkway. Um, portion of the end of the project limits near US Highway 59 will be a complete reconstruct as we shift the median over to make more room for truck turning movements. But for the most part, it's a, it's a mill and overlay project. This is the second time you're, you're seeing this project. We originally uh, bid it earlier um, in the year or late last year. I don't remember the dates, but we bid it as a concrete surfacing project. Bids came in um, a little higher than expected, and we uh, elected to reject bids and um, go forward with the mill and overlay. So we're bringing forward bids as a mill and overlay tonight. Two bids were received on March 7th. Uh, low 
little proposal coming from Dunnick Inc. again. Um, the amount was $1,374,151.96. That's a little under our estimate of $1.5 million. Um, as you indicated, this project will be paid in part by a local road improvement program grant that we were awarded a few years back, a couple years back. Um, so $1.25 million comes from that. The rest of the funding will come from our state aid account. So staff would recommend that we move forward with this project, and we'd also recommend executing the grant agreement. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Jason. Questions for Jason? In other words, there's no impact on the property tax levy on this project. Correct. I move the resolution accepting the bid and awarding the contract to Dunnick Incorporated of Prinsburg. I would second that. Motion by Craig, seconded by Steve. Discussion? <clears throat> if not, we'll move to a vote. We'll close the voting. John, did you? I did vote. You want to appropriately vote? Sure. I vote yay. Okay. Uh, recording uh, Council Member Elkhorn's vote, <clears throat> the vote uh, is approved, it is unanimous. So we'll move to agenda item number four. Oh, we have a second. I'm sorry. Runner. Thank you for correcting me, Craig. So with that, our second action here would be the resolution that would authorize the execution of the MnDOT grant agreement. I I'll move make that motion. Mo second it. Motion by Jim, seconded by Craig. Discussion? If not, we'll move to a vote. Close the voting. And the motion does pass. Agenda item number four is uh, West Lyon Street, North Third Street reconstruction project. Uh, we'll, once again, similar to the previous item, we will consider the resolution declaring the official intent of the city uh, to reimburse certain expenditures with the proceeds of tax uh, bonds or other obligations issued by the city. After that, then we will consider the resolution that would accept the bid and award the contract. <clears throat> with that, once again, I'll call on Jason Anderson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this is a project that's a complete reconstruction downtown uh, Lyon Street from College Drive to North 5th and uh, third from Maine to Redwood. A um, lot of uh, time spent on this one with uh, city staff, council committee, uh, downtown business group and others. Um, it's, been, it's been a long time developing this, but we're, we're here with bids tonight. We received bids on uh, March 9th. Uh, a parent low bid came from RNG Construction in the amount of $3,845,497.31. It's uh, slightly over our uh, latest estimate of around $3.6 million. Um, three bids were received. Um, staff believe it's, it's a very competitive bid. Um, you, you see the amount including contingency and engineering fees at uh, just under $4.7 million. Uh, project would be specially assessed in accordance with our current policy. Um, I'm happy to help address any questions that there may be, but we would recommend to award the contract. Questions for Jason? I have a question or I have a comment or a, we need to come up with a solution. The bid came $250,000 over what our estimate was. Is there something we can take out of this bid to bring it back in the line with what our estimate was, such as maybe that can be added later, such as some of the landscaping elements of it you know we still got to do the bones but is there a way we can shave this back down because as we all know money's a little tight in budgets right now sure um so you know i wasn't really prepared for that specific question so i don't have a um, an exact answer for you but i would say that um, one feature of keeping the landscaping elements in the contract is that you can then specially assess a portion of those costs anything you pull out um, you'll have to find a way to finance at a later date, either through the city or otherwise. But, but your uh, special assessments are mostly going to hit the limits of what the special assessment policy is, correct? Uh, we've, we would build the uh, assessment book in a manner that the streetscaping costs are separate from the street maximum. So the uh, streetscaping costs are above and beyond the street maximum. 
So I guess I'd like to see this brought back down the line what the estimate was because as as we've chatted and I've chatted with EJ, chatted with Sharon, we have budget problems right now. I mean, we, I, we're not terrible, but the money's tight. Plain and simple. We don't have problems, but money is tight. So I would like to see us, and I know originally we talked in PAT, Craig, correct me if I'm wrong, is doing the landscaping later. That was part of our discussion at some of those meetings. Right. We, we talked about that different places to trim things that putting the bones in but maybe not always putting all the all the dressing on it right away and so there again i i don't know what the what the whole answer is but i think you know that's the the landscaping would be the thing that would have the least amount of disruption in the in the <clears throat> bones of the project it's the one thing that that would be most frequently refreshed so i don't know if that's a good move or not but i mean again i agree we need to really watch the budget but if that also was reduced, that would not be able to be assessed back to the, the property owners that would benefit mostly from that. The landscaping elements that would be, if it was added back, that would be really added onto the general property tax levy. How much, if, if we would remove 250,000, how much is that gonna affect that assessment? 10%, $25,000? Uh, right now, uh, through council committee, we discussed an 80-20 assessment split on the streetscaping elements. So 20% of the cost. So about $50,000. Sharon, you had a Yeah, comment? I just had a question for Jason on the split, and he did explain 80-20. So the city's yeah. doing 80% and the property owner 20%, correct? Correct. Yeah. And, and just a follow-up, how much negotiation leeway do we have with the low bidder once the bid is accepted? I, I believe once we award the contract, we could certainly um, negotiate pay items with our contractor. Um, I, I believe that the contractor would be open to eliminating certain streetscaping items from the contract. There's been, I, I've heard some of those types of comments leading up through the bidding process, so. Mayor Council, can I make a comment? Go ahead. On the competitive bid process. So we have to. Oh. <clears throat> that's heavy. Um, so you need to be careful. This has been bid out, and it's an amount that's um, over the state limit for bidding. So when you when you put a, a bid specification together and you have um, interested contractors bidding on that, then any changes to those bid specifications um, before the contract has been awarded. Um, that would change, you know, but after you've may opened the bids and after you've made the recommendation, but before a contract's been awarded, then that can be challenged as um, not following the competitive bid rules. Now, with respect to like the overlay, there's a state statute with respect to things that have a unit price and quantity. And so that's why you have that leeway to have some of those budgetary um, changes. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't say this is too much, but you would have to reject the bids potentially and um, rebid it without the landscaping. Um, because landscaping isn't one of those situations where it is a unit price times the quantity. And the state law allows for some flexibility when you have that type of situation. But if, if you have a, a, a bid that has specifications for items and then all of a sudden you're taking items out, then other contractors can say, hey, wait, if I had known these, all these items were going to be out, my bid might have changed. So you just need to be careful in, in doing that. Okay, can I, um, first off, I should have introduced you before I turned it over to you. So City Attorney Pam Whitmore, the, um, just a clarifying question. If this bid was awarded and then by change order afterwards, there was minor elements that were, that were changed and authorized by change orders that didn't affect the total project, use the example of a, a, of a trash receptacle, removing things like that that still would not be allowable under? Well, so if, if you award the contract and then after the award of the contract, there's always oftentimes change orders. Right. Now, could you change substantial, like go a different direction with the project and somebody found out about that would be challenged. But no, there is um, the ability to after the contract's been awarded and if there's change of orders, that's a natural thing to have happen. Thank you. Yeah. 
Okay, other questions were without a motion on the table. We're still in the questions for uh, Public Works Director, City Engineer Anderson about his presentation. Any other questions? A comment, I'm, I'm certainly not in favor of rejecting the bids and going back out on the process. I think that would be unfair to the successful bidder. The packages are all out there now in the public eye and I think that would be a mistake. I would not be opposed to negotiating with the contractor to see if we can trim, uh, you know, get, get it closer back to what our, what our anticipated costs were to get the, the final budget or the final project costs down but I, I do not want to reject the bids and, and go over. I think that'd be a big mistake. Other input before we entertain a motion? See, I, I Craig, I, I agree with you, but in some respect, but if we're trying to cut $200,000, that's a lot, you know, that's a lot. And so I think to be fair, the rejection and sending it back out is probably the right thing to do. To save that kind of cash, and, it's, it's, and we're over two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Right, it's, a it's not a small. It's not a small amount. No. Other input. Uh, if I may, uh, I would have maybe some trepidation with rejecting the bids. I would just caution that um, you know once the contractor contractors have put their numbers on the table. You know, to reject all the bids and put a very similar project right back out is maybe not, in my opinion, the best practice. So um, I, I would I would hesitate to recommend that. But you know, maybe there's uh, opportunity for us to meet with a, the contractor after award and discuss uh, if council has some direction on certain items they don't like. I think coming up with two hundred and fifty thousand dollars of cuts will be may be asking a lot, but uh, we could certainly wor work through this and try to determine what what could be trimmed. Um, I do think we have good bids, um, or a good low bid. Uh, I, I, th I think this, this project probably doesn't get cheaper waiting. It's just a matter of deciding are we ready to, to go forward or not. And I, I, it, we, we have good numbers. I think we need to recognize that. Even though it is over budget, it is a good number. It's a very expensive project. Anytime you're working downtown, building front to building front, all paved, uh, it just adds up. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot going on in this project. So when this project was bid, the landscaping wasn't bid separate, so we could take part, like two parts of this bid. This is bid as one lump sum. It was bid all together. There was not bid with alternates. Craig? Yeah, and I... If we look at timing again, and that was a big part of our conversation as we were meeting with the downtown business association members and working through the details and trying to get to the final plan on this project, one of the big pushes on this too was timing and looking down the road at what, all, what else has to be done in this area. And one of the major concerns of the businesses that are along 3rd Street and Lyon and adjacent to them on Main Street was the concern about being tore up and the timing of that. Closing this down and going back for rebids changes our start dates, changes the effect of a contractor to mobilize and do the work and getting interferences with other projects. I just, I think we're, we're really opening up Pandora's box and I, I think we're inviting other problems. I just don't think that's a good business plan to do. I, I again, I, I'm in favor of trying to meet with the contractor and find out, you know, try to trim some of the costs off of this if we can, but I think going back and, and hitting the reject button on this and starting over is not a good idea. Any other input? And I just caution, I'm going to go back to my fellow council member, Meister says, when we do a budget, we go over budget, we, you've always said we're over budget, it's a bad thing. I can't actually quote how you've said that before because you're much more elegant than I am. But we're just, we're, we're close to 8% over budget. So let me let me take a different approach to this. You know, while we look at our at the stack of projects that we're looking at here, there are certain places that we can trim money on other things that we do, and that aren't the the bones, the fifty year bones that we propose this project to be. I would rather see us make up that two hundred and fifty thousand dollars somewhere else to get us through this push for this year. But kicking this project down the road is not. I just think it's a bad move. Let me ask you, Jason. Is there some place in your department that we could make up two hundred fifty thousand dollars? Let's. I'm gonna throw out there seal coating. 
Do we say, well, we got to maybe put the money toward downtown, not necessarily do as much seal coating this year to make up the $250,000 shortfall? I think we would need to have some conversation about contract law there because that was that contract's already been awarded. Well, that contract's been awarded. Okay, that's fine. I didn't realize that. We have mill and overlays. We have some other other projects. I just the point is, and that's probably not a fair question to ask Jason at this point. But the the point is, is that we have one large budget. We have many components of that budget, and this is one of those components. Yep. So I think that's your point. Is there is, that, probably, is there some place right, we can make it right, up? Right, right. And, and I, I realize I, that's our challenge also. It is, correct. They bring to us. Okay. And, so with that, I mean, this has been good discussion. If there's any other new information that people want to bring forward, now would be the time. Otherwise, I would entertain a motion. I move we approve the Resolution declaring the uh, intent to uh, reimburse proceeds from tax exempt bonds or other obligations to be used by the city. Motion by Craig, is there a second? I'd second that. Seconded by Amanda. Discussion on that motion? <laughs> if not, we'll move to a vote. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the one thing that I would say is, you know, I love the discussion we had, and like Council Member Schaefer said, this is a 50 year legacy project for downtown and I think we need to develop our downtown. I'll vote for this. I'm not really in favor of going over budget, but we've got to cut someplace else. And I'm only doing it because it's gonna be a legacy. It's gonna make Marshall look good downtown and hopefully draw more business, more people and be a good investment. Other discussion on the motion? If not, I'll move to a vote. We'll close the voting and the motion passes the next action then would be the follow-up action would be to consider the resolution accepting the bid and awarding the contract I move the resolution accepting the bid and awarding the contract second motion by Craig seconded by John to accept the bid and award the contract to RNG construction Discussion? If not, we'll move to a vote. And we'll close the voting. And the motion passes. Agenda item number, number five is also a word of bids. This is the last project we'll consider to this <coughs> evening. This is Legion Field Stormwater Improvement Projects Phase 2. We have the resolution. Uh, declaring the official intent of the city of Marshall uh, to reimburse the, certain expenditures with the proceeds of tax and bonds or other obligations issued by the city. And following that, we would consider the resolution accepting a bid and awarding the contract. Once again, Jason. Thank you, Mayor. This is um, a ponding improvements project that um, kind of spawned from the, the study we did in 2018 or 19 in the Legion Field area after there was significant flooding in the area, causing some, some damage to properties. Um, this phase two project is a, a dry pond addition to the wet pond that's located in the Parkway um, subdivision. Um, this, there's the installation of a 42 inch storm sewer pipe underneath the railroad tracks, uh, just uh, north and west of the Buffalo Ridge concrete plant and uh, the construction of a, a dry ponding area over there to help contain the floodwaters and slowly release the runoff. Um, we received bids on March 8th for this project. We were pleased to see five bids. Uh, Town and Country Excavating, the Garvin, uh, was the low bid in the amount of $703,749.60. This is uh, a little ways below estimate. Um, of, the estimate was 861000 uh, staff would uh, recommend that we, we move forward with this project. We've got a, a total cost, including contingency and engineering fees, at uh, $857,167. Thank you, Jason. Questions for Jason? Once again, the funding source for this is Stormwater Utility. Discussion or uh, input? If not, is there a motion on the first action? <clears throat> Make a motion. A motion by C. Is there a second? I'll second. Seconded by Amanda. 
for the resolution declaring the official intent of the City of Marshall to reimburse expenditures with the proceeds of tax exempt bonds or other obligations issued by the City. Discussion on that motion? If not, we'll move to a vote. We'll close the voting. And the motion does pass. We'll now consider the resolution that would accept the bid and award the contract. I move the resolution accepting the bid and awarding the contract. I'd second that. Motion by Craig, seconded by Amanda. Discussion? If not, we'll move to a vote. Close the voting. And the motion does pass. We'll move then to the consent agenda. We'll bring the items up on the screen that are on the consent agenda this evening. We'll bring them a little bit higher so I can read them. Uh, and they include consider the approval to allow alcohol beverages at city owned facilities and parks, consider the approval for a temporary on sale liquor license for the Lyon County Ag Society, consider the approval for a no, new tobacco license for DG Retail LLC. The frontline warning system, which is the outdoor warning sirens, contract for maintenance with the city of Marshall. Consider the approval of the amendments uh, to the personnel policies. Consider the resolution and also authorization for the submission of the Minnesota DNR outdoor recreation grant. Consider the approval for the out of state travel request. And then finally, consider the approval of the bills and the project payments. Is there any item on the consent agenda any member of the council wants? Removed for purposes of separate discussion. Move to approve. Second. Motion by Steve, seconded by Craig. Discussion? If not, we'll move to a vote. We'll close the voting. And the motion does pass. We we'll move then to agenda item number 14. Consider the Conditional use permit re request location is 522 Jaguar Court. I'll call on um, Ilya first, Ilya Gutman, and then after that I'll ask uh, Attorney Pam Whitmore, unless you want to reverse okay, the order. Is it okay if I just lay some groundwork first? Sure. So um, City Attorney uh, Pam Whitmore, uh, we'll talk a bit bit about the uh, the process and the um, um, kind of the legal direction that the city has in conditional use permits. Pam? I'm going to stand here if that's okay, Mayor and Council Great. Members. Good evening. Um, so on your agenda, you have the uh, consideration of the recommendation by the Planning Commission for the denial of a request for a conditional use permit for property located at 522 Jagger Court. And so I want to just, um, Mr. Guman is going to really give you the background. I wanted to give you kind of the legal basis on conditional use permits in general, so just so you have a feel for when he's telling you what um, the circumstances are that you can be able to think those through. And it can help with the discussion. So just as a caveat before I talk about it, the um, conditional use permits, since um, they're related to land use, they are subject to the 60-day rule under 1599. This permit was submitted at January 20. Um, 9th, I believe. And so that 60 day is going to be at the end of March. So there, what that means is there either needs to be a decision on this um, permit or if council sees some direction to staff for some additional work or to the planning commission, then that should be extended for another 60 days, which it can be, but it has to be done um, within that 60 day time frame. So um, we have this conditional use permit. The city needs to decide on the request. Um, so, so what happened here, as you'll hear about, is the, the application came in, staff made a recommendation to planning commission to grant the um, conditional use permit um, after their debate, after planning commission had their debate and their discussion and heard from public as well, they made a rec they're making a recommendation to council for the denial of that. So I want you just to be aware of as you're thinking this through, the standard for granting or denying conditional use permits in the state of Minnesota, if anything, is, is challenged. So any decision that we all make as a city council um, 
it needs to be based on a reasonable findings. And so that reasonable basis, reasonable findings, you'll hear those interchanged. You'll hear people say you can't be arbitrary and capricious. So those are all legal terms that are easy to throw around, but what does it mean, right? And that's the important part. Well, so the courts have given us some parameters. So as you're thinking this through, um, what the courts would be looking at is, what does our comp plan say? What is the guidance under the comp plan? What are the factors then in our ordinance? Okay, and that ordinance that applies is 8649. Um, and then look to see if the applicant themselves, because they have the standard or the burden of proving that they have established all the standards that are, are set forth in that ordinance um, as the conditions for allowing that permitted use. So um, if, if the applicant has met those standards, has proven that, that their request is compliant with the, our ordinance, then the burden shifts to looking at um, what the planning commission is basing its recommendation or what the decision is basing the recommendation on. So it has to further public welfare, health, safety, all of those types of factors, which then um, it's important to note that the Supreme Court has had a decision that has stated that it's appropriate to consider neighborhood input and opposition, but it can't um, be a reasonable basis to have that be the only factor. Okay, so I just wanted you all to know that before you heard about um, the the applica application and the situation. Do you have any questions for me about that before we hear um, from Ilya? Questions? <clears throat> Thank okay. you. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. And Ilya. <coughs> Thank you, Mayor Council. So this request uh, uh, to, for the uh, single ownership duplex, it's a R1 single family uh, uh, district. So all duplexes require conditional use permit. That's why it came first to the Planning Commission and then it's coming to you for decision. Uh, uh, there's uh, section uh, 8649, which lists the criteria for uh, granting uh, conditional uses, uh, use permits. And uh, before uh, going to the Planning Commission, the uh, staff reviewed that thing, and based on the criteria and the circumstance, uh, it recommended approval to the Planning Commission. During the Planning Commission uh, public hearing, there were some uh, concerns uh, voiced by the uh, people around, and at the end, uh, the Planning Commission uh, make a decision to recommend to the Council denial based on uh, this particular property, not compatibility with the, the neighborhood. Uh, I want to bring a few other things. So first of all, uh, during the planning commission meeting, people did not have the plans of the building or any information about how it will look like and where it will be located. So it's, uh, they didn't have that information at all. Uh, you do have the drawings in front of you. So you have a, a floor plan, a site plan, and the elevations. I just want to mention that the site plan, the way it is presented to you, does not meet the ordinance currently because it does not meet the required rear yard uh, uh, numbers. Rear so, yard or side yard? Rear yards. Okay. So whatever is shown here uh, is not in compliance. So just wanted to be aware of that thing. And with that, uh, uh, I will leave it with you. If you have any questions, I'll... Uh, okay, thank you, Elia. Is it not in compliance because of total space available or just the placement of the structure on the property? Uh, placement, the, uh, the distance, uh, the so rear yard. It could be adjusted to be It can be adjusted. Okay. Correct. Any other questions for Ilya? I do. So this is facing two separate streets. Correct. So if a guy would slide this over, you could per se split this lot and make this a twin home and it would fall into the compliance of our ordinance. Uh, you, you mean R one? A twin a twin home can go into an R one. No, twin home. When you say twin home, what is the terminology? You can split this lot in two. So it will be separate separate ownership, right? Correct. It will still require a conditional use permit. With separate ownership, I thought a twin home could sit into no, an R one. It still requires a conditional use permit if it's on two separate lots. Correct. If a twin home sets on two separate lots with a common wall. You do not need a conditional use permit. Yeah, because you don't have any side it's, it's So the ordinance says that uh, either single ownership uh, or uh, separate ownership duplexes require conditional use permits. The thing is, if you, uh, just a consideration, if you look at the uh, a twin, a twin home as you define it, 
in reality, it doesn't meet the uh, side yard regulations. So it's either way. It's either a variance or conditional use, and the ordinance looks at it as a conditional use. Any other questions for Ilya? Amanda, as the liaison to the Planning Commission, anything more that would be added from Planning Commission? Not a lot more. I mean, the concern was, you know, this is an R1 residential neighborhood. These people built, I mean, they were, it was, it was based a lot around um, feelings of, you know, you, the people who live there now built their homes, they moved there, they invested in this neighborhood that was going to be single family homes and now they're concerned about that and so that's where the planning commission was i think tied up um they weren't again we didn't have the plans of the house they didn't know what it looked like they didn't know if it was suitable they didn't they were struggling with that too compatibility was the big thing but that was all in our notes so. okay open up for any other uh, uh input from the council so just so I'm clear, Mr. Mayor, and I'm going to address this to Pam. So given the knowledge that we just heard, there's no reason, from what I understand from what you said, just because of neighborhood disagreement legally that we can deny a conditional use permit. Because it um, seems, according to Ilya, as long as there's some modifications made, that it'll meet requirements. So thank you, Council Member. Um, so... The, the legal basis is that the sole reason can't be because of neighborhood opposition. Um, that's really the legal basis. And so if this council has a discussion and finds that in addition to that, with the respect to the compatibility, um, any of your, your actual criteria in your ordinance are not met, um, then, then that would support a finding of not granting it that would be the reasonable basis but just strictly on neighborhood opposition um, has been actually there's a court case that says that that's not the only reason that can support a finding so um you know the planning commission uh, didn't have the plans in front of them they couldn't um have you yeah they couldn't um have make sure that the setbacks were right, that the yard um, distances were right, the height. Um, there's some provisions in the ordinance about concurrent streets, corner lots, all of that. So there are quite, there's quite a few things to check off the list to make sure that it's compliant. And I just don't think that the materials were there to really do that analysis. I was not at the Planning Commission, however. So, so I defer to staff as far as the actual metrics so, Pam, um, I'm not suggesting language for a, a motion, but if there was language for a motion either way, it would be important to outline the reasons for either approving it based on staff recommendations and every, you know, all of the things that uh, were outlined, or if there's a motion to deny it, it would be based on a number of factors that would be over and above uh, neighborhood objections, things like compatibility with the neighborhood, R, R1 versus R2, maybe uh, lack of rear yard setback, or you know other other issues that actually could be identified. So either way, it was what I'm saying is Correct. I think what you're saying is there needs to be uh, the reasonable motion needs to have justification. Way. Correct. Okay. So then I'm going to go back to a question to you, Elias. So if this house gets placed correctly onto this lot, it meets all those other criteria of. Correct setbacks, correct backyard. Correct, yes. Correct. It is adjusted to uh, 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 comply with the rear yard. It looks like location on the uh, uh, lot meets the, will, you, will meet the criteria. It will comply with all of our other, per se, ordinances for a building structure on this lot. It does. There are, there are not too many, uh, like, a square, square footage of the lot. It does meet that requirement. Steve, can I ask you to pull up this corner lot on the map where how it sits That one there. And there would be a driveway going to both roads, correct? Yes, that's how it's shown on the drawing. <coughs> Did you have more you want to say on that? Or? No. Okay. I, okay. I, well, okay. I, don't know, so but I think it fits into this lot. Dumping on both corners, it actually, if you, don't know it's a 
duplex driving by it, you're not going to know it unless you really pay attention to it. Yeah, we would have a driveway on Windstar, which yep. is a different type of a street than the, Correct. the normal residential streets. So. Any other questions for Ilya? If not, any other discussion of the council before I entertain a motion? Steve. How much time, energy, effort from the staff would it be given that we didn't have all the information at the Planning Commission where the community members didn't have it obviously either? Would it be how much of an onerous thing would it be to bump it back to the Planning Commission now that they have everything and maybe Attorney Whitmore could be there and let everybody talk again and give their input again? Well, and, we'll and you want to repeat on the... Um, the 60 day compliance. That's right, and that's given that. Right. So council has the you know ability to do that, to have that discretion to do that. Um, I'll let the staff answer your specific question about the burden on that, but um, we, if that happens, then we would just need to let the applicant know that we are extending that 60 day period for another 60 days. You're not talking about denying, you're talking about extending it. Yes, right. Give, let people have full information. You can't make a decision without full information. Stephen, I think I, I appreciate where you're coming from on that, and I, and I think it is important to, you know, to address public input, but I also think that the questions have been answered that the only single issue that would still remain would be neighborhood opposition, otherwise it meets all the other criteria. So even in the best world, if the opposition didn't change, and it was still able to sway the recommendation of the Planning Commission. While I really tend to really respect and want to rely on recommendations made by our boards and commissions, I think there is different information here that they didn't have, and I think the onus is always on us to make the correct and legal decision, and I think our pathway forward is pretty clear. I mean, I think that we don't have grounds to deny this. That's my feeling. I don't believe we have grounds to deny it, and I think it would be inappropriate to deny it. I think one of the grounds, though, if there was grounds, is that in our comprehensive plan, this is listed as an R1 rather than an R2. Right. So the overall Pam said that can't be the only reason, but that would be one reason, so. So that along with the public opposition could allow it to be denied. Okay. Well, so keep in mind that the argument back to that will be that in your ordinance, which is that <coughs> 8649, that's about R1. That's, and in R1, you as a council have authorized that this can be a permitted under use, use under a conditional use permit. So um, what, just being simply R1, um, there is a court case, it's the Crystal Beach Bay case that says, um, for opposition that says that um, they, you know, live there and, and bought there because they, thought it was just going to be single family homes. The court has said back to that, that if the ordinance lists it as a possibility, um, then, then that um, is, defeats their, that argument to some extent. Now, the practical matter is, do any of us really read all the ordinances when we move no, right. into a city? Right. But that is what the court would say. Um, so, um, so that would, so the court is going to be looking for more things like it doesn't meet the yard requirements, it's the compatibility is it's too high or its use is, you know, um, a commercial use that is not a residential use that's not in your list of, you know, conditional uses, traffic issues. Um, uh, those are the types of things, you know. Um, lack of screening, if there's some things that need to be, that kind of stuff is what it um, is in addition to. Like I said, you can consider neighborhood opposition, for sure. Just can't be the only reason. Right. Any other questions? My question, is this the only place they could place this uh, unit? Is, is, this, is this lot the only option for something like this or? And Pam, I'm gonna have you weigh in on that because the answer to that maybe, and John, I wanna be respectful, is that uh, the answer to that probably doesn't matter doesn't because matter. this is the request for this location. Yeah, so we're, we're tied to what the request was made. So, gotcha. Okay. 
Otherwise, we're arbitrary and capricious. Right. With that, I would entertain a motion. I would make a motion to approve the conditional use permit due to the fact that it does fit into the lot and into the compliance of our ordinances and, and in whatever ordinance you read off that we can allow duplexes in R1 zones with the conditional use permit. We don't really have a reason to deny it. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second that. Motion by Jim, seconded by Craig. Now discussion on the motion. Uh, are you including the condition which is listed there? Well, yes. Yep. Any other discussion on the motion? Pam. So recommend that um, you make sure that the site plan you have in front of you is modified, you know, on the condition that it's modified with it meeting the appropriate. I will add that area. to my motion. Yeah. yeah, that it has to be submitted a conforming plan and that plan has to be followed. Discussion on the motion. <clears throat> If not, I'll move to a vote. We'll close the voting. And the motion does pass. Four, three. Thank you, Ilya. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. We'll move then to agenda item number 15. Agenda item number 15, the body worn camera and squad car cameras. Um, Chief Jim Marshall, Director of Public Safety. Jim. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you for your time. I appreciate that. Um, tonight, your agenda item is obviously regarding our body cameras and our squad car cameras. Some of you may recall almost four years ago when we implemented our body camera program, discussions that took place both through council, through private discussions, through public meetings. I mean, we talked about um, policy procedure, we talked about retention of data, we talked about the data requests, we talked about costs at that time, and we also talked about some of those unknown expenses, those downstream costs with it. Um, since then, we've realized that these body cameras are perhaps one of the most important pieces of equipment that we have. In short, they bring transparency to and accountability on both sides of the camera. We're very grateful for that. Um, and I can tell you that your officers are thankful for having these cameras. At that time, four years ago, we went with a company that was called WatchGuard, and I actually have one of those cameras with others pass. He's it's turned on now so we can do beauty shots. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and at that time... Well, I guess I might be on. <laughs> Four years ago, it made sense to go with WatchGuard. We had been currently, at that time, using the squad car cameras, and we had those for over five years. They had worked well. And these body cameras integrated with those squad car cameras, meaning that if you turn on your emergency lights, it would fire up your camera. Things would sync. We could upload and download data from those cameras in the squad car, so it made sense. This past fall in October, we were contacted by the Motorola company, and they had informed us that they had purchased the WatchGuard camera company and that they were going to be honoring the service agreements on the WatchGuard camera as long as they were under warranty. Once the warranty was up, that they would not, no longer service that. So they encouraged us to transition into their product, Motorola product, and look at uh, either purchasing or leasing uh, their equipment. We met with the Sheriff's Department. We met with representatives from um, Motorola. We met with IT staff from the county to really look to see what our options were. During those discussions, we realized that probably a uh, cloud storage-based system was going to be best. We had purchased a server, as some of you can recall the first time, but we knew that the amount of data that we're starting to collect is enormous when we really think of the amount of calls that we're on and all the body cameras running. So. Uh, IT's recommendation was that we look at the storage um, part of this. We, at that time, reached out to Axon, who's actually the leading camera company for law enforcement. They have over 70% of the law enforcement body cameras in the country. And maybe more um, impressive than that is they have over 90% of your metro, your larger department's body cameras um, nationwide. So we reached out to them and we asked them for a proposal as well. At that time, we received a proposal from Motorola and 
axon. We brought those proposals to the Equipment Review Committee. Uh, at that time, the recommendation was to move forward with the request uh, proposal given by Axon. Axon was the lowest bidder. They have an, an incredible product that is simple, yet incredible in its capabilities, even for staffing and what we can do with that. So I maybe we'll just stop and answer any questions that you may have. I also have with me Captain Ryan Hoffman. Ryan's been part of a lot of the discussions and meetings that we've had with both companies. So. Um, I'll open it up for any questions. Thank you, Jim, and I do appreciate the amount of research that uh, you and your staff have put into this. So. I'm going to pass this. This one would be the Axon body camera as well, so you can compare the two. Questions for Jim? Um, just a comment again, and we did spend a good bit of time at the Equipment Review Committee talking about this and the pros and cons, and um, I know the recommendation of the Equipment Review Committee is is definitely to support the proposal to go to the Axon cameras. And I also had some time after we spoke, Jim, to talk to my son Tyler, who hmm. the PD that he serves in Texas is going through the exact same thing and they're making the exact same decision for uh, all those same reasons. Sure. So it proves out very well there too. We would hope that they're gonna be here for a long time. They're a pretty stable company and we won't find ourselves in this position in a few years down the road. And the two other factors, and, and you did refer to this, the um, no longer will there be the need for the local server. Right. And, but um, our need will still exist because that stores the data from all of our other recordings for the last four years. Right, sure. right, but moving forward. Yes. The, um, and also looking at all of the alternate um, products uh, and also considering the cloud storage, the... Um, this is actually the most economical choice to make, too. It is, you know, but the reality is that this is our world now, and we know that these costs are not ever going to go away. They're going to go into perpetuity. So, you know, I've been working close with EJ, and the nice thing with the Axon company right now is they've given us some options in terms of payment. And I know EJ's had a chance to reach out to the company as well to see what that picture might look like in the next five years for us as well. Thank you. Any other questions for Jim? If not, you have the recommendation from the not only the staff, but the Public Improvement and Transportation Committee. I would entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Motion by Jim, seconded by Craig. Discussion? The only thing I want to add to this is I think it's very important that we keep these cameras up to date for our police officers because it protects them, protects our public, it protects the city. It's just a very, very smart thing to do even Though we're going a little earlier in one or two, I think this is a must do. Yep. Great. Any other discussion on the motion? If not, we'll move to a vote. And we'll close the voting. And the motion does pass. Agenda item number 16, consider appointments to various boards and commissions. The earlier this <coughs> evening, the council did interview applicants for various boards and commissions, and based on those applications and interviews, I would recommend that Bryce Gordner be appointed to the Convention and Visitors Bureau. This will be his first term. He has served a partial, less than half a term prior to this. This term would expire on uh, the 28th of February, 2025 that Andrew Kinchy be appointed to the Police Advisory Board. That term would be would be effective May 31st, 2023, and would expire May 31st, 2026. That Tanisha Juarez be appointed to the Public Housing Commission for a term that will expire May 31st, 2026. So I would make that recommendation, entertain a motion to affirm. I make a motion to affirm. Motion, second. Motion by Amanda, seconded by Steve. Discussion? If not, we'll move to a vote. And we'll close the voting. And the motion does pass. Did you intend to abstain? I did, because I wasn't there for the... Okay, great. The motion still passes. The um, We'll move then to... Uh, Commission Board Liaison reports, um, Jim, or excuse me, Craig. I oh, you can go with Jim first. Oh, Craig is <laughs> Jim, so. Uh, I was thinking of you, but looking at him. So, that, Craig. That's troubling. But I think that's a privilege. <laughs> 
Um, I have nothing to report. I, the airport commission will be meeting Thursday. I plan on being in Texas by the time they convene, so I'll miss that. And uh, if you check, I think I know that the uh, Merit Center, Jasmine, always submits in the uh, administrative report, so please follow that, and I won't take up any more time. We might actually get out of here at record. Steve? Mine meets tomorrow. EDA meets tomorrow, so the other ones have not met. Amanda? We talked about planning commission tonight, um, EDAs tomorrow. I did attend my first public housing commission meeting last night. Um, did talk about some improvements to the park view, replacing 22 patio doors or sliding doors. Um, and then there was also a public housing assessment done um, by HUD, no, you, Department of Housing and Urban Development, yes. Um, they had a very good scores. Um, only place they were docked was in some of the physical aspects, a couple windows, a tripping hazard on a sidewalk, and all are being corrected. So Very good. Uh, for my part, the um, mine either have not met or in the case of the Southwest Regional Development Commission, where their meeting last week was canceled because of the weather. It's going to be rescheduled on, I believe, next Monday. I have a work conflict at that date. So, John? Nope. Nobody met. Let's uh, see. Um, DEI talked about World Cafe results about um, we formed a subcommittee about how to distribute that information that we gathered from the community. Um, so hopefully that should be out in the next few months here. And then the library, we just kind of talked about the outreach program and how to um, f figure out some numbers for that still. Um, and then we also talked about strategic plan for the library. Uh, CVB, we have met over at the upper room, so we got a chance to see the really nice vacuum. Um, and then we did Cassie's annual review, and Cassie's done a really good job um, leading the CVB. So that's all I have. See, so you, you may also want to mention that um, our joint library board, unless we want to do that differently, you and I and um, uh, Sharon uh, met with the county representatives for the library board to talk about outreach. Maybe that's what you were referencing too. Yeah, we were talking, yeah, we were talking about that one. Well, this is the, they did bring it up and talk about it at the board meeting, right. also about that meeting that we met previous week, so. Okay. So the council does know we did have that meeting with the county. Good. Yeah. Jim? Mine did not meet. Okay. Then we'll move to uh, council member individual items, Craig. Um, just kind of real quick again as we get into hopefully spring here soon in the upcoming snow. Fire hydrants, make sure you get them open if you have them in your block or on your property. And if you know where your storm drains are and you can chip away to kind of open those up too. If we get the warm weather they're talking about starting next week with all the snow we have, it's gonna be pretty important to make sure that that water has somewhere to go. And other than that, I have nothing else. Okay, thank you. Steve? Kind of on the same thing, there's a lot of sidewalks that still need to be shoveled and it's getting hard, I know that, but uh, it's tough, so Amanda. your best. I've got nothing. Jim? It's 6.30 and it's still light out, that's all I got today. <laughs> See? Uh, we did have, I did have somebody, a uh, constituent, email me about the aquatic center and just concerns about the noise um, ordinance, but I did check with um, Preston and um, they checked with the Yankton one and they don't have any issues at all with noise there. So that is not a concern at all. Okay. And John. Nothing. So uh, the thing I will talk about this evening and I'm passing out a, a sheet and hopefully there's enough there. Um, several meetings ago, um, we had considerable discussion about the a potential rental ordinance and in the community and at that time the follow-up uh, discussion was that we need a process to um I guess that down to, the uh we would need a process so that we could have a uh, a mechanism for input for a work group so this is the proposal that uh, i'd bring forward is that um that our rental and short-term rental best practices review committee and recognizing staff's had input on this uh, city attorney Whitmore has also uh, been uh, helpful on this too. So the committee membership are suggesting that there will be two chairs that would facilitate this pro this process. This would be an ad hoc committee, it wouldn't be a, a, a standing committee of the city council, that there'd be two council members that would be Member of, members of this ad hoc committee, and I would welcome interest from council members. I'm not, I don't have any pre-selected. I'd you know, welcome your, uh, your input as your uh, willingness to serve on this. 
and that we would then have a uh, um, probably a Google Forms type um, application process that uh, we would have landlords to renters or renter advocates to and then two agency um, advocates representing United Community Action and SMSU. And then of course there's the staff that would be involved, including our, our fire chief, our public works director, uh, the police chief, our building official or the designee and the city attorney. So, so you can see the, and I won't read this, but the purposes of the committee and the and the guiding principle so that there is really a um, kind of outline of what the expectations for this group would be and the expectations would be that they come back with a recommendation to the council. So think about this. Um, we would probably move forward with the solicitation of the individuals who would be interested in serving um, on this short term uh, review committee, both from the council as well as from the constituency groups that have been outlined. With that, um, Pam, you have anything you want to add? No. Okay. Any questions on that? We okay? Okay. With that. I guess I, guess I will add one thing, if, if, and I'll be quick. So just um, so process-wise, we have a base. Process-wise for most efficient use and of people's time and the committee input is that we have uh, um, drafted a base ordinance. And just to, to reassure the council, um, you know, these rental ordinances are common in communities across the state. And so this is not something that, um, that the council should necessarily shy away from the discussion at all because they're, they're, they are common. Um, so I just will add that um, as you consider whether you want to be on this committee or not. <laughs> Thank you, Tam. Pam. With that, um, we'll move along. And Pam, I should say, you know, maybe in the next budget we can afford an extra microphone so we so you have to have one. So. I'm okay with, other than the soft voice, I'm okay without a microphone. <laughs> with that, then we'll move to staff reports. Sharon? Yeah, I just want to add a little bit to the um, rental code review committee. I did by mistake put the fire chief twice on that. advisory staff. Uh, <laughs> obviously, we really want him there. So um, I wanted to make that note. My apologies. And then also, I did want to highlight that the city attorney is looking at an alternative enforcement process uh, rather than using the court system, which I think, um, I think could be a really good avenue uh, for some of the issues we face. And it may, to me, I, I think it would be supported by, by all. It, that's just my feeling on it. Um, it just seems to make sense. So I wanted to point out that. And then uh, just a little more uh, highlights that library meeting, if you, if you don't mind, um, Mr. Mayor and Council Member um, Lesky, that we, um, I believe that the library director is going to come back with some better numbers on how to uh, possibly fund fund the daycare reading program. Uh, one of the things that we're kind of running into, we're almost getting to the 2024 budget process again with the county. And um, so we'll kind of see if it just gets us to 2024, or if there'll be some kind of mid-year adjustment. And we did not commit the city to any additional funding at this time. Um, but I do think there's strong interest from the county. And a lot of times we um, like to mention percentage increases. I, I did note that um, really for the county, it wasn't, wasn't a huge budgetary increase if they wanted to continue to fund it. It would be more for the city, just based on our uh, historical past, past um, funding um, cost share ratio. So wanted to mention that. And I don't know, Mr. Mayor, if you wanted me to talk just really briefly about testimony today at the. Go ahead. OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah just real forget. brief. And I know you've done this several times. So it's kind of the <coughs> same story, different day. But the mayor and I did testify today to the Senate Tax Committee. Just another kind of procedural step for their aquatic center. 
And um, I did not watch the end of the hearing. I assume that it was, um, it moved forward. We still need to take some uh, procedural steps with the House side, and we're waiting for the House Tax <coughs> Committee chair to uh, really help us move that forward. So, but I think it went fairly well, and it, and I do think, even though it was very brief, it was very beneficial to be in person rather than presenting by Zoom. So, and appreciate Preston Stensrud who actually drove. We were a little concerned about weather. So, Can I uh, just that's, two things? Yep. So, uh, first off, this was an in-person one. There was two prior ones that, um, that we were involved <coughs> in, both on the Senate side, uh, where we um, provided input. Um, both of those were not official hearings, but they were um, meetings of the of the Senate Tax Committee. So, but they weren't classified as a hearing. This was the first hearing. Senator Dames uh, introduced the the legislation, and he also offered an amendment, which will be helpful uh, for the community, also. So, Senator Dames um, really was an advocate for us today. So, thank you. Yeah. One just. Quick thing on the Aquatic Center, since we're talking about it, we are going to get kind of an upcoming schedule of next steps from the uh, pool Aquatic Center engineers. And once we get that, we'll share that with you too. I know they want to have another public input session and get a little more feedback. So just wanted to comment on that. And that's all I had, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Any questions for Sharon? Jason? Thank you, Mayor. Um, as we transition into spring, another Reminder to piggyback on Councilman Schaefer's comments is to uh, make sure your sump pump discharges outside as well. It's a big topic that time of year for the wastewater team, and we're always kind of monitoring flows and uh, inflow and infiltration kind of continues to be a problem in our community. So make sure that your sump pump discharges outside, not inside the home. It's actually against the law unless you have a permit between the uh, winter months. So. Um, just a reminder on that. And then the wastewater team has also been really busy with the chloride effort and trying to get people to use the rebate that we have out there. Uh, you'll hear more radio ads, things like that. We'll also add some sump pump reminders to the radio uh, stuff as well, as, as well as the utility stuff are coming out again related to the rebate program and sump pump disconnection. So a couple of messages we're trying to continue to, to move, I guess. And then the wastewater folks are also, uh, Scott and his team, they're they're going to business to business, trying to identify high water users and make sure that everything's optimized in their, in their properties too. So a lot of effort going on there. We still have a ways to go. So that's all I've got. Okay, thank you. And Pam. Nothing for the good of all. Okay. So for the council, you have the remaining items, which includes the administrator briefs, the listing of building permits, um, as well, and note that one of those building permits in, involves the Shopco property, so that's good to see. And then finally, the listing of upcoming meetings. Is there anything to, else to come forward this evening? If not, is there a motion to adjourn? So, second. Motion by Craig, seconded by Steve to adjourn discussion. If not, we'll move to a vote. I will close the voting. <clears throat> and the motion passes, we are adjourned.